Hello and welcome to the Asia Thinker series organized by the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy here in Singapore. I'm Niharika Mandana, the Southeast Asia Bureau Chief for the Wall Street Journal and your moderator for the evening. We're going to speak today about the US presidential election. It's the perfect time, of course, to be having this discussion one week away from election day in the United States. Seismic events have occurred this year, chiefly the coronavirus pandemic that have shaped both President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden's campaigns. To help us unpack what the stakes are and what the outcome of this election might mean for Asia, I'm being joined by an excellent lineup of speakers, all keen observers of Asia and the world. We have with us Angela Mancini, who is a partner at Control Risks and the head of the consultancy's Southeast Asia office. Drew Thompson is a visiting senior research fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and a former Department of Defense official responsible for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia, who served under both Democrat and Republican administrations. We also have Temur Beg, who is the Managing Director and Chief Economist at DBS Group Research. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, before we begin, here's a quick overview of the next 75 minutes. We'll begin with opening remarks from each of our speakers of roughly five minutes each, after which I'll ask them some questions, and we'll also take questions from viewers. So if you're watching, please go ahead and drop your questions in the comments section, and I'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So we have a lot of ground to cover today, and so let's just begin. Um, Drew, if I can begin with you, the description blurb for the event says, with the US's declining influence on the region, China has visibly dominated. Do you agree with the basic premise there that US power in Asia has declined? Um, and give us the highlights of the last four years of the Trump administration, what that's meant for Asia. Sure, uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the description of the seminar is intended to be provocative, um, but I, I, don't, I don't fully agree with the framing. And, and I think it's an open question about whether US influence is declining in the region. So, I mean, the notion that that the US is in decline and that China is somehow visibly dominating is really an echo of the China narrative. And that narrative is really only receptive in small pockets of Southeast Asia, where I think certain people are, are somewhat enthralled with uh, China's rise and they're apt to declare that China's rise is somehow inevitable. But I think if you look at the domestic challenges uh, and the behaviors of, of the Chinese Communist Party, it indicates pretty clearly that, that China's rise is not at all inevitable, and it's something that they, that they worked very hard to achieve, and it's something that, uh, that they don't take for granted at all. So the pervasive narrative that the US is disengaged from Asia is also, I think, quite misleading, uh, though it is borne out by opinion survey data, and I don't deny that the narrative exists or that it's popular in some quarters, but again, I think it's really more a, reflective, a reflection of the effectiveness of Chinese propaganda and the ineffectiveness of US strategic communications. Um, I've had some Chinese friends and interlocutors point out that um, you know, if American power or influence is not declining in actual terms, they'll argue that because China's power is rising, that the US is therefore declining in relative terms. And, and that's one way to look at it, but it's a very much a, a, a compelling argument if you see the world in zero sum games, zero sum terms. Um, but I think if you, if you take stock at some of the things that have happened uh, in, in the Trump administration, I mean, clearly the, President Trump has moved the needle on bilateral China policy, um, but there's also the widespread perception that he fell short on Asia policy as a whole. And I think uh, it's, it's, a fair, it's a fair criticism that he and his advisors really only saw Asia or the rest of Asia as a theater for competition with China. And, and I think that fundamentally undervalues and underappreciates the intrinsic value of the rest of Asia. So, so there's some truth in that. Um, and again, some of this gets repeated, for instance, when President Trump didn't go to the East Asia summit uh, last October. And I think there's some substantive, uh, uh, definitely some misses in, in the last four years. I mean, President Trump didn't really have a coherent trade agenda for the region. You had trade fights with, with allies and partners. You had burden sharing fights with South Korea, most, most obviously, but with other allies as well. You didn't really have a good military posture agenda for the region. And, and then some other opportunities were missed, such as a, a, an FTA with Taiwan, which is the US uh, 10th or 11th largest trading partner. The Quad is another example of maybe a missed opportunity. I think the Quad was more of an affair, not really a romance. Um, uh, and certainly 
you know, the Trump administration has stepped up and been much more forward leaning and demonstrative on things like the South China Sea. But again, the facts on the ground were already changed at that point by China. And again, the, the uh, fumbles of the previous administration on the South China Sea just couldn't be recovered by more regular and frequent fawn ops, for example, and, and, and those missives are just not having that big an effect. But that said, I think US relations with key Southeast Asian states has definitely deepened and strengthened in a lot of ways, especially security relations. Um, and at the same time, you know, China's, um, China's engagements in Southeast Asia have also come under a certain degree of strain as well. I mean, if you look at Vietnam, Thailand, President Duterte in the Philippines, they're all now pretty actively hedging away from China after the benefits of, of deeper engagement just didn't materialize. Uh, Indonesia, another country, more, much more forcibly standing up for its rights against China. Uh, we saw uh, Defense Minister uh, Prabowo visiting Washington last week uh, to meet with Secretary Esper. And again, you know, this close to the election, they're, they're not treating President Trump like a lame duck. Um, Esper and Pompeo are having their two plus two in India today, um, followed by Pre uh, Secretary Pompeo visiting Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Indonesia, I think, later this week. So, so, so that's just this week. I mean, you look at, for instance, the U.S. and Thailand, you know, signed a joint vision statement last year at the ADMM. At the same meeting, you know, Thailand signed an agreement with China, uh, which indicates that, you know, again, the U.S. is not like forcing countries to necessarily choose sides, right? It's also not a sign that the U.S. is retreating, but it's definitely a sign that Taiwan, uh, that, that Thailand is, is hedging. Uh, at the same time, you know, the U.S. isn't co coercing or stopping Thailand from buying uh, Chinese weapon systems. They're buying submarines, they're buying amphibious ships, cruise missiles, tanks, APCs. And at the same time, the U.S. is selling similar items to Taiwan uh, to Thailand as well, like Black Hawk helicopters, uh, uh, missiles, and and the striker armored vehicles around which large parts of the Taiwan uh, the, sorry, the Thailand army are going to be reconfigured in their brigade combat team. So so the U.S. is deeply deeply integrated into the security calculations of of countries like Thailand. And then again, look at Singapore here, where you know last week the Secretary of the Navy was here. Um, and then last month, you had the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy having the Strategic Security Policy Dialogue with Singapore. Uh, and of course, last year, uh, Singapore renewed their MOU, uh, which extends the, the relationship through to 2035. So again, these aren't indications that Washington is somehow pulling back from the region. Um, the other thing that's also really worth looking at is Japan, which has, I think, also made some pretty big strides in the region. Uh, they're deepening their relationships with Vietnam in particular. They're considering arms sales to Vietnam. And then again, just look at Prime Minister Suga's first visit uh, uh, overseas, and he's going to Vietnam and Indonesia. I mean, obviously, he's not going to go to China, but it's quite interesting he's not going to the U.S. But I think whichever administration is going to win uh, uh, in the next term, that president is going to face a region that's pretty much in full hedging mode, and that reflects a lack of confidence in the U.S., I think, and concern about what life would be like under a Chinese-led region. So I think from the regional perspective, you know, most countries really, I think, face a, a Siberian dilemma, you know, where if you fall through the ice when you're fishing, you know, the water is freezing, you're going to die in 30 minutes. But if you jump out, the air is at 40 degrees below, you know, you're going to die in two minutes. So, so it's really a difficult situation. So you don't have much confidence, I think, in either a Biden or a Trump presidency going forward. I think U.S. credibility in the region has been on the decline under the previous two administrations, right? Bush was distracted by the Middle East. Obama was very much risk averse and overly deliberative, um, couldn't execute the pivot to Asia very effectively. And Trump, of course, is just extremely erratic and over fixated on China at the expense of the rest of the region. So the question for a potential Biden administration is, you know, he's bringing back many of the same foreign policy characters that were in the Obama administration. So that doesn't necessarily reassure. But on the other hand, you know, Biden is much more predictable and he's gonna be certainly more dignified. And that's a good thing. Um, he's less likely to lean hard on allies um, and, and, and push, push hard on issues such as trade or burden sharing. But that I think also underscores a deeper concern that, that the Biden administration might not be willing to take risks or that they're not willing to induce friction whether with friends or competitors. So, so I think there's concern that this could be an administration of half measures in foreign policy. And, and, and that's a real problem. Uh, again, though, I mentioned that you know, Japan is, is on the upswing here and is increasingly popular. Uh, 
Um, certainly, uh, ICS uh, in their annual survey of the state of Southeast Asia finds that you know, Japan is the most popular uh, country in the region and that they're seen as, as the country that will do the right thing uh, to provide public goods. So, so the Biden administration would probably be more likely to work collaboratively with Japan and that's a positive thing. I think lastly, um, uh, it'll be very difficult to distinguish a Biden administration from the Trump one based on what we've heard so far. Um, Biden has reintroduced that paradox of balancing competition and cooperation, uh, which is uh, basically one of the challenges that the Obama administration had. And the Obama administration certainly at the very beginning sought to accommodate China, doing things like not meeting the Dalai Lama in 2009, um, and unfortunately, a lot of that accommodation effort really didn't bear any results and, and China ended up pocketing uh, most of that restraint. So the question would be, could Biden come into office and then return to a sort of a pre-Trump trade and economic paradigm, um, maybe trying to join uh, uh, CPTPP or something and expand US economic influence in the region to compete directly with China. Uh, but that's gonna be tough for him because he'll face, he'll face pushback from within the Democratic Party that I think secretly kind of likes Trump's tariff heavy managed trade approach uh, and the bring back manufacturing mantra. So, so I think, you know, Asian leaders aren't particularly happy with the choices that they confront in the presidential candidates. Um, but again, if it's any consolation, I don't think the American public's terribly happy with them either. Thanks very much, Drew. There's so much to dissect in, in what you said, and particularly on the last point, I read somewhere recently um, a speculation about whether um, Joe Biden would be Trump 2.0 um, uh, or, or Trump light uh, or Obama 2.0. Um, people just trying to figure out where, where based on things that have been said so far in the campaign, where he would stand. Um, is there more if I could turn to you? Um, does the level of interest in the US election among investors, policymakers and others in Asia differ, you think, from past election cycles? Uh, for instance, is there a difference between the 2008 election, which uh, took place at the height of the financial crisis, and the 2020 election, which is taking place in the midst of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, thanks, Niharika. I think uh, Drew has set a fantastic uh, foundation for our discussion here. Um, look, in 08, it was firefighting of a different kind. Banks were under stress. You wanted to know what the Fed and the ECB were going to do, and to the extent that you had outstanding stewards of the central banks around the world who maintained their jobs even under the incoming Obama administration. The scores did not change. The US moved through 2007 to 2008 into a big crisis, uh, stumbled initially, but then the end game was very clear. Large amount of support for the economy, increased regulation on the banking system to make sure that the reversal uh, or, or the, the, the losses of the 2007-08 crisis are not repeated. And, and there, there was very little difference from the outgoing Bush administration and the incoming Obama administration. Things are very different now. And expectations are, of course, that uh, things will change if indeed there is a uh, change of leadership in the White House. And let's not sort of, you know, count our eggs. Who knows? Week to go. Uh, but uh, sitting here in Asia, yes, yeah, sentiment is guarded. Interest is considerable. And there are four scenarios people are thinking about a blue wave, which I suppose the market is pricing into a large degree, but then also the possibility that the Senate at the last second does not swing to the Democrats and Biden is somewhat powerless in the legislative route, uh, has to sort of rely on the executive route uh, to carry out his policy agenda. Therefore, even a Biden victory would not be that overwhelming a change in the US stance around the world. Uh, the third one is of course a shock Trump victory and under which I would expect you know, greater volatility and the uh, unpredictability of the last few years to be continued. I think we should be very clear on one issue that you know, Trump is pretty sincere and stuck in his beliefs. Uh, way back in 1987, he took a full page ad in the New York Times uh, criticizing Ronald Reagan for being soft on Japan and the language that he used in that ad are the language, is the language that he uses today. You know, the world is laughing at us and we have to uh, take on tariffs against people who are taking advantage of us. Our allies have to pay us more money for protection, all that kind of stuff. So don't expect uh, to buy or don't buy that narrative that a Trump term two would be somehow more pragmatic and less dogmatic. I mean, the man is an old man and his dogma is not going to change whether he gets reelected or not. And then the fourth one, the very one the, that concerns everybody is a contested election where 
we will be sitting here on the 4th, 5th, and 6th of November, and the race will be too close to call, and there'll be all sorts of state and federal level challenges to the election outcome, and that would be, of course, overwhelmingly negative for the market. I want to step back from that prognostication and point out a couple of very strong trends that have been in place uh, for a while, and Trump hasn't really changed that trend despite all the talk of U.S.-China strife. Um, so you heard Drew talk about how the U.S. has actually been fairly engaged with ASEAN and North Asia and so on in the areas of foreign policy and defense uh, cooperation. Well, you would think that given the rhetoric around protectionism and trade war, that that is not the case for US businesses, that they are now less invested in Asia, they're less invested in China and so on. And the numbers tell you the opposite story. It turns out that global investors remain very long Asia and very long China. And by global investors, I mean everybody, including American investors. So FDI in the region and to China continue to rise all the way through 2019. Even this year, despite all the pandemic related disruptions, FDI from the US into China flat on a year on year basis, astonishing. Um, move on from foreign direct investment to even capital flows. Are American investors shying away from investing into Chinese IPOs? Absolutely not. Look at the Ant Financial IPO today. Who are the biggest buyers of Ant Financial IPO today? American institutional uh, banks. Um, what about uh, China's uh, you know, fledgling and gradually opening, opened up a bond market? Who are the big investors there? American buy side companies. So the US by no means is decoupling from China when you look at the hard numbers on portfolio investment, on capital market participation, and foreign direct investment. And as a result, the Chinese RMB remains well supported. And through the course of this year, uh, again, despite all that talk of trade war, China is the strongest exporter in the world, growing on the back of exports and production that is export oriented. So for these trends to remain, however, uh, the US elections are potentially very, very consequential. Just because four years of trade war did not undermine this trend doesn't mean that eight years of trade war will not. Um, so I think that uh, unpredictability and volatility around trade, investment, and finance uh, could be damaging and have long lasting implication notwithstanding the points that I just made about the trends not having been affected over the last four years. So issues like tariffs, import restriction, entities list, CFIUS, or the listing of Chinese companies in US stock market, all those issues are of paramount importance and Asian investors are looking at all of them to get a sense of you know, what happens to uh, markets and investments and economies uh, post US election. Now, Asia, as we all know, is very much about trade and commerce across borders. It's about prospering through a rules-based system. Trans-Pacific Partnership was supposed to create that dynamic, that minus China, you will have a group of like-minded countries who will play by higher standards on intellectual property, on sec data security, and so on. And if China wants to join that club, well, it would have to raise its game. It became very bilateral over the last four years. I don't think Biden has the political capital to re-engage on this matter immediately after elections. There are many, many other higher priority issues, but hopefully at some point, provided that he has some degree of legislative support, some degree of goodwill toward Asia, it may be something that he may address in his administration as opposed to being completely off the table under Trump. But let's also be very clear, and that'll be my first point, that life is not gonna become status quo ante under a Biden administration, even if there is a blue wave. Some trends were accentuated by the Trump presidency, but they're not likely to reverse. Uh, tariffs, once they go up, tough to bring them down. And it's the Democratic Party, which is usually the tariff party, not the Republicans. So Trump, in a way, stole that vote from the Democrats, and the Democrats are not going to be able to rewrite that issue so easily. Uh, similarly, restrictions on supply chain and Chinese technology are not going to go away. So for the Huawei's of the world and the SMICs of the world, uh, life is not gonna become wonderful. You may see their shares rally in case of a Biden presidency, uh, but it may well be ephemeral. So let's keep an eye on that. Thanks so much, Temu. That was a fantastic survey of the possibilities. Um, on most days, there's so much going on. I think it's really helpful to have someone break it down into kind of four um, distinct, understandable uh, eventualities. Um, then let me turn to Angela uh, for a view from the business community. This is obviously a great, it's a time of great uncertainty for businesses. Um, if you're a multinational with a lot of exposure to Asia, um, what are the stakes here for you in this election? And if, if I could ask, what outcome would you be hoping for? 
Yeah, there's just so much to unpack there. I think Drew and Tamara did a great job outlining a lot of the key themes. I mean, I think, so we spend, you know, all day, every day out talking to clients about their real world issues in this market um, as it relates to anything, you know, regarding risk. And there's a couple key areas that, you know, clients keep telling us. They want to understand how ugly is this election going to get both next week and then in the time period until January, whether it's contested or not, which we can talk about. They want to know, are they going to be able to plan? So we're going to get some of that certainty back that we had before the Trump era. And they want to then understand, you know, plan for what? So what's that going to look like? So in the first, the first instance, I mean, they are, I think everyone's watching it closely. I've been on the phone with several clients even today that are saying, you know, it's so much to watch. It's, it's hard to, to, to not watch it. But, you know, as it relates to, you know, practical business, there's a lot at stake for businesses here, regardless of where their, you know, global headquarters are, regardless of the types of countries they're in across the market, almost everybody's in China. So that's obviously a huge one as well. But there's just um, a, a lot of potential impact. So the first issue, as I said, is how ugly is it going to get, right? So there's a lot of concern as people are, you know, I'm sure on this call watching closely as well, around potential security issues on election day or the couple of days after, right? Because both sides, you know, think they're gonna win. Both sides are very nervous. A lot of disinformation out there in the media. Um, both sides have lawyered up as it were, expecting a lot of lawsuits. We already have close to 200 lawsuits as it is already related to um, absentee ballots and, and kind of the voter mechanism. And we're seeing things in this election that, you know, we haven't seen ever in the United States, right? We've got you know a global pandemic. We've got record rates of early and mail-in ballots. We've got a president that has basically you know undercut the legitimacy of the electoral process for months, saying you know it's it's going to be fraudulent if I don't win. So these are things we haven't seen you know in modern times. So there's a lot to kind of watch for there. What does it mean for business? Uh, interestingly enough, there were 50 leaders you may have seen came out and signed a letter recently, including Reid Hoffman from LinkedIn, Marissa Meyer, formerly with Yahoo, um, to at basically asking the business community to um, help their staff and employees have patience, asking the media not to call it too early if they don't really have the facts, and asking the, um, the local election sites to also take their time before they call it. So a lot of risks there are fascinating that the business community is actually coming out and preemptively calling for calm. UBS came out and said, you know, even more disconcerting than a, than a blue wave for the market, some of the markets that they're looking at would be just the uncertainty. So a lot of concern there. If there is, um, let's say a clean Biden win, there's still a lot of uncertainty between now and January, what might happen. So some investors are saying to us, you know, does Trump, does he still pay attention, um, you know, or is he too busy thinking about, you know, what happens, you know, once he steps out in January, um, or, you know, what might be the issues around, you know, China, is there, you know, the, the so-called, you know, are we going to throw a lot of things at China, you know, in those couple of months, burn, you know, scorched earth uh, mentality, and, and throw on things like export controls and more sanctions that business has to deal with. So a lot of uncertainty there. But let's assume we put that aside, and we say, okay, you know, let's hope not a heavily contested election and not a, a, a rocky transition period, businesses are basically saying, you know, are we going to have more certainty? So I've had clients say to me, you know, we spend so much time trying to understand what is coming out in terms of regulation, what matters to us, you know, as a business, what does all this regulation actually mean? What do we have to actually do? A lot of money going into compliance, not just on the US regulations that are coming out as it relates to China, sanctions and export controls, but you know, a lot of things on the Chinese side as well, the Chinese cybersecurity law and the rest of it. So just a lot of investment and time going into multinationals, uh, trying to figure out how they actually tackle and comply with kind of both sides, concerns about bifurcation of the internet, um, concerns about you know, the trade and tech war and the rest of it that we have all been following closely. So business, if you're saying whose business, you know, going for it, you know, depends on the sector, of course. I mean, oil and gas, construction, real estate have, have, you know, put a lot of money into the Trump campaign. If you look at things like clean energy, new technology jobs, um, you know, that's, you know, those would be beneficiaries of a Biden campaign. So, so it depends on the, um, it depends on the sector, but I think everybody is hoping for more certainty uh, in the next four years than we've had in the last four years as it relates to business planning. And I think that um, 
certainly a Biden administration, someone was saying the other day, you know, make America boring again. <laughs> and from a business perspective, that's not a bad thing. Um, so there are some that are, that are hoping for that. And then, you know, then you think, okay, regardless of kind of the global issues and the uncertainty type issues, um, what, what can we specifically plan for? And, you know, underpinning all of it, I think for business is COVID. So, you know, wither COVID is wither budgets for next year, lockdowns, you know, the economy, can people do business travel? How fast are people going to bounce back or not? If you look at China and what that economy is doing now, it's roaring, right? It's roaring back. They've, um, they've had the virus under control. A lot of our European clients and American clients too, for that matter, are saying that their Q4 in China this year is gonna actually exceed last year, which is shocking, right, given what's happening. But there's a lot of headquarters that are looking to the China business to drive a lot of the profits that they're certainly not getting from other places. Um, so, you know, Goldman Sachs and Moody's have both come out recently with reports saying, you know, if Biden were elected, just the fact that he would, um, have a, a different plan to tackle COVID and get that under control more quickly would, would lead the U.S. to have a faster recovery and would bode well for global economic growth. That I think underpins a lot of what business is looking for. Um, and then finally, I would say, you know, China, almost every single multinational investor that certainly that we work with is, you know, has a pretty big footprint in China. So everyone's looking to that U.S.-China relationship um, you know, people have a sense of what they can expect in a Trump term too. People have said, is that going to be President Trump unleashed? And I think, you know, certainly he gets uh, praise from a lot of quarters for being tough on China. That in and of itself is probably the only, at this point, bipartisan issue in the United States, this feeling of we need to get tough on China, um, on, on trade issues, on IP issues and the rest of it. Um, but, you know, a Biden administration would certainly have a different style but the substance of being on tough on China probably wouldn't change all that much in our assessment. However, um, he would prosecute that through alliances, right? So the Biden campaign has been um, very vocal in saying, you know, they would go back to that. They know they can't, uh, you know, turn back the clock to the Obama years. You know, there's reasons maybe why they wouldn't want to do that anyways. But, you know, certainly the idea of trying to work with alliances with other countries in Asia, you know, with Europe, trying to um, work together on certain issues that uh, that could then help be a counterweight to China. And some of those could be trade and, and CPTPP as well. And then also looking to China to kind of, as they say, compete where we must cooperate or we can. So there's areas potentially um, environment and climate that one could cooperate with, with China. But in, you know, in some, I would say business is watching this regardless of where they're headquartered from what we see, they're watching it really, really closely. And from a practical perspective, it's all about what does it mean for the global economic recovery and recovery in this market from a numbers perspective? And number one, and number two, what does it mean for my day-to-day, -day, you know, I wanna get out and do business, I wanna be left alone, I wanna be able to plan, and what is that then gonna look like, particularly re regarding China with the two different administrations? So lots of people watching closely. Thanks very much, Angela. I'm hoping we'll have enough time to break down at least two of those kind of big buckets that you touched on, the coronavirus and whether um, a, a, a second Trump presidency um, differs from uh, a Biden presidency in terms of uh, how the coronavirus progresses over the next few years, um, as well as US-China uh, relations and the trajectory of of that, but before I get into that, I wanted to um, pick up on uh, on what Drew uh, said about U.S. power. Um, Louis uh, Asia Power Index for 2020, and and this is for you, Drew, uh, because I want to press you a little bit on some of the comments that you made um, about U.S. presence in the region. Um, the, the Louis uh, Power Index sort of says uh, the US remains the most powerful country in Asia, uh, but the lead that it had vis-a-vis -vis China uh, has narrowed substantially from uh, just two years ago. Um, and part of that is, of course, the pandemic and the varying responses to the pandemic in the US and uh, in China, some of which Angela touched on. But there's obviously broader um, and in Louis' um, observation, more kind of uh, irreversible and systemic 
economic uh, factors at play. And the one thing I want to read out to you uh, that they say uh, kind of on an overarching level is that this closing power disparity suggests that Washington, far from being the undisputed unipolar power, can more correctly be described as the first among equals in a bipolar Indo-Pacific. Um, so the question I want to ask you is, is, is the US's unipolar moment um, over? Uh, and I want to tack on uh, another question that we have from uh, one of our uh, viewers um, about something you said in your opening remarks uh, on US engagement. And the question is this, um, isn't disengagement uh, a deliberate strategy of the Trump administration um, rather than, as you described it, kind of the Chinese narrative or Chinese propaganda? Drew, you're on mute. Sorry, I forgot we're, we're muting and unmuting. Um, so that's a lot to unpack, um, but a couple of quick reactions. Um, one of the issues, and, and again, I don't dispute the findings or the methodologies of these, of these uh, index and surveys, um, but one should distinguish between the actual employment and, and deployment of power and the perceptions of power. So they can be two very different things. And I think in some cases, the US has suffered from a deficit in the perception of its influence and its presence. Um, and you see that, you certainly see that as, as, as Timur had said, right? The, you know, the US may not be the largest trading partner uh, for many countries, but it, in some cases it's the largest foreign direct investor in that country, which is, you know, which is certainly a, a huge piece of connectivity and a very durable and permanent one. Um, so, so in some respects, it's a question of what's the yardstick that you're using to measure that influence. And again, are you comparing it to, to China in relative terms? So that's one thing to consider too, as you're looking at this, but I don't, again, don't question that, that China's influence is definitely increasing and the perception of it is increasing, certainly. But in terms of the, the unipolar moment, I think the Trump administration has recognized, though they haven't necessarily articulated it that clearly, but they've recognized that um, you know, the unipolar moment is definitely over. And I think the world is more multipolar. Uh, and I think the Robert O'Brien, the US National Security Advisor said something to that effect a couple of days ago. He said, it really is a unipolar, uh, multipolar world at this point. Um, and I think that's a reflection also of part of the Trump administration's approach towards increasing burden sharing, getting other allies to step up and provide more for common defense and common security. We certainly see that taking place in with NATO partners, but you see that here as well. So, so you have a, a sort of an alliance approach that's somewhat grating, but definitely there's a recognition that the US cannot confront global challenges alone the way they did necessarily during the Cold War. So, so I think the recognition that the G2 is, 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 is not really realistic either. I mean, China's flat out rejected any notion that there would be a G2, and that partly reflects calculations in Beijing that it's not prepared to take on uh, global responsibilities either. It definitely wants to dominate regionally. Uh, it definitely wants deference, um, and it wants respect, and it wants to have a certain... Um, uh, hegemony over its its neighbors and in the region, but it's not prepared to take on global public good delivery the way the U.S. perhaps did uh, during the Cold War. So from that perspective, I don't think there's much prospect for a G2. To your question about resilience um, or disengagement, I think the way to, to think of it is, is less about disengagement and more about resilience. I mean, the, 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 the disengagement issue, the divestiture issue um, between the two sides, I think is a recognition. And I think that the Trump administration officials have a very acute sense of the vulnerability that trade with China brings. It's a trade trap in their minds. So essentially, if you become overly dependent on China as your trade, as your trade partner, you run a real risk of having China use that trading relationship as diplomatic coercion or point of leverage. And, and we've seen that happen certainly in Australia's case most recently, but other countries, Norway, South Korea, Japan with the rare earths, Philippines. So when China has a political dispute, they're quick to use their trade relationship, they're quick to use economic levers such as outbound tourism as a pressure point. So, so I think the Trump administration has sought to build greater 
resilience um, from, from the ability to be coerced. And we've seen that in efforts, for instance, to expand a US domestic uh, or a non-China capability to produce say rare earths and rare earth materials that are used for so many future um, uh, critical technologies. So I think the, the, whole, the whole debate about, about um, divestiture or, or, or separation is really kind of missing some, some key strategies. It's also worth noting that China has been a key driver of this desire for um, its own resilience and its own self-sufficiency. And that's been part of Chinese import substitution policy since it joined the WTO. And it's been part of their you know, made in China 2035 policies. Um, and much of their industrial policy is about having that, that resilience um, against uh, uh, leverage from foreigners or dependency on, on foreign partners. So in some ways, this is becoming increasingly a trend. It's a, inherently an anti-globalization trend. It's a lack of confidence in market-based systems that are leading the two superpowers to essentially uh, create greater resilience from one another. So the real challenge, of course, for, for smaller countries is, um, and trading partners is how do, you, how do you navigate that new complexity? Thanks very much, Drew. I want to get into some of those specific issues. But before that, I want to talk for a few minutes about the coronavirus, which um, some people describe as being the backdrop to this election, but um, I see is very much in the foreground. Um, Angela, if I can ask you, has the coronavirus eroded President Trump's incumbent advantage? And how much stock are you and, and people that you're talking to in the business community um, putting in the polls that predict a Biden victory? Yeah, well, first on the virus, I, you know, I think that upended, frankly, the election. <laughs> I mean, you know, we don't have a winner yet. We're not sure what's going to happen. But in the absence of that, there were, um, you know, a lot of people saying this is Trump's, you know, to lose. It's very common to go back in an incumbent, especially with a strong economy. And he had that going for him. I think, you know, with the coronavirus, obviously, it not only hit the U.S. economy very hard, but the um, the way that the Trump administration has dealt with it, which is basically by not dealing with it, you're letting the states deal with it. You're, you know, kind of sowing disinformation. Um, you know, it's kind of state by state as to what, what's happening. As Americans that are listening into this know, it's actually not even just state by state. It's actually, you know, district and county by county as to whether you have masks and can are your kids back in school or not. Are you going back to your office? I mean, it's all over the place. And until that's under control, there's really no, um, you know, there's, there's kind of no easy sight as to when the U.S. is actually going to recover. So I think the response to that is what has turned certain constituencies like seniors, for example, uh, more against Trump than they would have been, you know, with, with the virus uh, not having happened or having been dealt with more uh, aggressively and, and, you know, professionally from the get-go. Um, you know, in terms of the polls, it's, you know, that's the that's the $64,000 question, right? So, you know, the, the national polls and many, you know, state by state polls have um, uh, a potential, you know, Biden predicted win. Um, a lot of people look to 2016 and say the polls were off. They actually weren't as far off, uh, certainly not very far off on the popular vote. Certainly they were off with the, with the actual results. But as you know, people that watch US politics know we don't have one election, we essentially have 50 elections, right? 50 state elections uh, to watch for. So the way the polls have been constructed this time are different. In fact, they started constructing them differently in 2018. So they're actually looking at things now they're correcting for factoring in education levels, they're factoring in Nate Silver's uh, 538 has a, um, an uncertainty index, which also takes into account just the volume of news and kind of what's happening as well. So in principle, the polls are more accurate than they were, um, you know, certainly four years ago, but there's a lot to, you know, a, a lot that we don't know as well. Are people actually answering polls? There's the kind of the concept of the shy Trump voter, which are voters that uh, either don't answer the polls or they don't answer correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, at any, even in the best of circumstances, the best you're going to get within polling is within about four points. And this race is going to be quite close in, in many jurisdictions. So um, certainly, you know, I think some people are looking to those polls and saying, well, there's, you know, potential blue wave. And as, you know, Timur mentioned that maybe that impacts the markets already have been pricing that in. But um, I personally think that, we, you know, we're not going to know until we get closer and we really understand 
where we are, uh, particularly as it relates to the absentee mail-in ballots, because that is unprecedented this time around. Thanks, Angela. Um, so we've talked about the impact of the pandemic on the election. Uh, then what if I could ask you about the impact of the election on the pandemic? I mean, everyone realizes at this point that the pandemic is going to be a multi-year event uh, and that policy decisions over the coming months and years will determine the shape of the global economic recovery, things like vaccine distribution, for instance. Um, Will the outcome of this election have tangible effects, you think, on how the world emerges from the pandemic? In other words, could 2023 or 2022 look very different depending on who's in the Oval Office? Yeah, I think there are two areas where it can matter a lot. But first of all, let's concede the possibility that some really good news on the vaccine and the antiviral therapeutics could be in store for us in the next few months. Um, I look at epidemiologists who have been very cautious about the likely efficacy and safety of our vaccine development, which is understandable because it normally takes a very long time. But we're beginning to see signs of confidence coming from the labs, that especially the two dose approach that the major vaccine manufacturers are going for, that normally improves the efficacy of vaccines substantially. So let's concede that possibility regardless of the election outcome. But yes, Elections have consequences and they will have consequences in this one. It shouldn't, but it would, simply because the approach toward the coronavirus crisis is so fundamentally different between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And if the elections go the way polls are suggesting, everybody would look back through the you know, coming history uh, that it is that dropping off the ball, not the crisis of the uh, pandemic related recession, but the pandemic management itself that hurt the Trump administration substantially. So whether it is a max wearing mandate or the way to calibrate what uh, Thomas Prio calls the hammer and the dance, which is even in the second and third wave, you don't shut the entire economy down, but do you drew it in isolated areas where the risk is substantial, but you keep the rest of the area continuing? I think that sort of science-based approach would become the norm as opposed to a, a rather destructive political narrative where wearing a mask becomes a sign of your political affiliation, which I think is uh, uh, very unfortunate and probably has caused a lot of damage in terms of lives and livelihood in the US, if not in, elsewhere in the world. And look, for all the talk of US engagement, disengagement and so on, the US still is a you know, shining beacon on many things. Unfortunately, it has not been on this one, but I can easily see the narrative shifting if the signals coming out of the US becomes one of cooperation with the World Health Organization, a global vaccine initiative of making it available expeditiously across the world at zero or very nominal cost, all of those things, as opposed to the very unfortunate vaccine nationalism that we're seeing, where the US is sort of bribing companies to make sure that if they take money for them for vaccine development, the first call is for the US and not for everybody else, which is, can become a big issue in France and elsewhere. So yeah, I think that uh, your, your question is very apt that, you know, the pandemics determine election, elections will also determine the pandemic management because it's been so politicized over the last couple, uh, couple of months or about six months or so. Great, thank you. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about US-China, so I'm going to pivot to that uh, very quickly. Uh, and there's, there's many things to discuss there. Drew, if I can start with you on that subject. Um, there's uh, two things I want to ask you. One is this question of whether the a Biden presidency would somehow reset um, US-China relations uh, where animosity has increased substantially over the last few months. Um, and, and the question I want to ask you there is, you know, you had um, Deputy NSA Matt Pottinger say a few days ago that there is a new consensus on China, and that consensus is not restricted to Washington. It is a whole of society consensus about how the U.S. Uh, ought to respond to China. Um, what, what do you make of that assessment? Do you think um, that that, in fact, is the current uh, state of affairs and it doesn't matter uh, to, to an extent who is in the White House. A uh, related question is uh, something that Joe Biden said in, um, in a recent interview when asked about the biggest threat, uh, which country poses the biggest threat to the United States. And he said, uh, Russia is uh, the biggest threat to the United States. On China, he said this, he said the biggest competitor is China. And depending on how we handle that will determine whether we're competitors or whether we end up being in a more serious competition related to force. Um, how do you read that statement in terms of Biden's intention uh, going into um, 
into a possible presidency. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, I'll let um, I'll let Matt Pottinger speak for himself. Um, uh, I did watch his 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 speech in Chinese uh, earlier this week or, or late last week. Um, uh, I, I think one certainly can see the U.S. government taking an all of government approach to competing with China in this administration. So there's definitely a government consensus on addressing all aspects of competition with China, whether that's economic, whether that's law enforcement. So I think there's a much greater attention throughout the US government. Examples include things like the, the China Initiative that was uh, started in, uh, I think, November 2018, where the Justice Department began working closely with uh, other law enforcement and courts and, and, and various uh, jurisdictions to help them bring and do investigations in more cases against uh, cases of intellectual property theft, for example. So from that perspective, I think there is a consensus that things like intellectual property theft, uh, whether it's through you know, insider or cyber means um, is unacceptable. I, I haven't seen data to the effect that there's somehow a national social con uh, consensus amongst the American citizenry that's against China. Certainly though, public opinion polling towards China has demonstrated that there is less confidence, less trust um, and, and less positive sentiments towards China as a nation. So in that respect, I think it's, it's, um, there's a basis for that. We've certainly seen both Democrats and, and Republicans um, uh, taking a stronger stance on China, but that's not new. I mean, you can remember back in 2000, 2001 period when, um, when there was so much debate about bringing China into the WTO and the US working through its agreements with China that made that happen. And there, were cons there was considerable political uh, wrestling that took place on both the left and the right on the political spectrum uh, to, to get that to happen. And again, the, the, the Democrats were much more focused on issues like human rights, on uh, religious freedoms, and, and some, of the, uh, uh, some of the challenges that China presents to say the international system. On the other hand, the conservatives and the Republicans were much more focused on you know, the economic and security threats that China presented. So again, I think those concerns about China have always been there. They've just become much more popular. So that makes it really, I think, difficult, if not impossible, for Biden to somehow return to an Obama era status quo. I, again, remember, I think you know, Vice President Biden, before he was vice president, spent much of his adult life you know, in the Senate. And I think he's really going to lean on his colleagues in the Senate for advice and sentiment um, that's gonna help inform his choices. I think that's his, you know, that's his community and that's where he's gonna draw from. And I think that's going to very much put him in the position of dealing with, in some cases, what's a very broken bilateral relationship, trying to bring some structure back to it, more engagements, but not just for engagement's sake, but towards achieving very clear objectives for the United States and hopefully with a results uh, oriented approach that, um, that, the, that the Obama administration, I think in some cases lacked uh, and that the Trump administration is really focused on. So, so the Trump administration has been very clear about their um, results oriented objective for the relationship. And I think if, if Biden takes elements of both of the previous two administrations approach and makes a hybrid where he engages, but then engages for effect, measurable outcomes, then I think that would be very positive. But one of the challenges, of course, is that China is very reluctant to, um, to, to, to make internal domestic changes uh, or, or, or accommodate the US. And that can result in endless meetings with very few outcomes. We certainly see that in, for instance, uh, Europe's attempts to get a better trade relationship with China where they're facing these delaying tactics and frustrations over, over China's uh, admonitions that we should meet midway, for example, and we should compromise here. And the European response is that we've already opened up our markets to you, now we're seeking reciprocity. So I think if the Biden administration approaches the relationship with a bit more sensitivity, a bit more structure, and, but with these objectives of actually achieving reciprocity and achieving concrete measurable outcomes that hold China accountable, then, then we're in, I think, a much better place than we are today. I think your second question was on um, 
uh, Biden's uh, brief interview with 60 Minutes on you know the, the main threat being Russia. Uh, again, I think that's part of of maybe what concerns countries in the region here is that is that he doesn't quite have the same clarity on uh, on what threats are to 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 the United States. Um, I mean, Russia presents challenges for certain, but I think in terms of a military conflict, and he mentioned use of force. I think China's it. China China is is a central actor in all of the Asian hotspots where the U.S. could find itself in a kinetic conflict. Taiwan, I think, being the the number one potential uh, potential scenario where you know the U.S. could find itself defending an ally or a partner in Taiwan's case uh, against uh, against China. Uh, the East China Sea would be another one, and I think that makes China in a very different category of threat than than Russia by a long shot. So again, I think Biden's foreign policy judgments raises questions about about US credibility here in the region that I don't think is, is, is helpful. Angela, I wanna put some of this to you because of course the trajectory of the US-China relationship has a huge impact on um, decisions that businesses make in terms of supply chain location, for instance. There's been a lot of talk in these last few years about businesses weighing their presence in China. One view is that businesses um, are and inevitably will have to diversify out of China given the uncertainties of the relationship between the US and China. The other view is that the coronavirus may have actually strengthened China's position as a place in which to, a stable place in which to um, invest. Um, so what is your sense of how the business community is looking at their decision making on supply chains uh, in the context of a Biden presidency potentially? Yeah, so I think, you know, first of all, if we take a step back and look at supply chains, the, the story of um, Western multinationals moving supply chains out of China has been around for a number of years. Um, it certainly got a lot of headlines during uh, the, you know, the first couple of years of the Trump administration, you know, the trade war before we got to phase one and the rest of it. And now, of course, with COVID, you know, it's accelerating the trend of moving supply chains. But the first point I'd make is supply chains were already moving because produced manufacturing in China has gotten more expensive relative to other markets. For example, you know, Vietnam is the one a lot of people um, cite. So that the, those Change, um, changes to supply chains were already happening. Um, there is a limit because no one country can compete with China in terms of the size and scale and skilled labor pool that they have there to, um, to actually do that manufacturing. So that, you know, there's a limit to how much you can move into the Philippines or, or you know, or Vietnam or Malaysia or what have you. Um, again, certainly COVID has also accelerated some of the supply chain shifts because what we see a lot with our clients, and we read about this in the headlines as well, is a lot of companies were going for the kind of just-in-time supply chain model. Let's keep it really lean. Let's assume that we're always going to have the ability to move parts around, you know, borders without any issue. And we saw that that really blew up in a lot of people's faces during COVID, and and you know things got stuck in certain markets. You know, perishable goods, you know, perished on the docks and the rest of it. So. Um, that has accelerated the, the move towards more regional supply chains, right? So we have some clients say to us, you know, we were already starting to, and now we really are producing in China for China, in Europe for Europe, and we're, you know, it's more expensive, but we're having a more resilient supply chains by having the, those be, um, be regional. But I think, you know, to your point, a lot of businesses, as we started to talk about earlier, are really looking at that U.S.-China relationship and what does it mean for supply chains on things like, sanctions on things like export controls, because every new um, issue that's introduced into the relationship, you know, again, companies just have to go back and figure out how can we be compliant? Can we, in some cases, can we be compliant with both what the U.S. is asking and what China is asking us to do? You know, we're not sure. So just a lot of time and effort being put into what does that look like? And supply chains don't change in a dime, right? These are very complex sophisticated models, you can't just, just turn them around overnight. Um, the last point I make is in terms of what we're actually seeing with business and our clients and the data I think bears this out is it's not so much that um, American clients in particular are necessarily moving out of China, it's more impacting their um, thinking as it relates to new investment. So again, we have seen some movements out of China, but we're not, as we talk to clients, we're not hearing them say, we are moving out of China. We're, what we hear them saying is we're making a lot of money in China. It's a huge market for us. And in fact, 
you know, a big piece of our, our profit targets are, you know, coming out of China. And so HQ is really looking to us to deliver that. Having said that, there's a lot of challenges. It's getting more expensive vis-a-vis -vis all the things that we're discussing. And if we're thinking about new investment, maybe we're thinking about putting that somewhere else. But we're not saying we're not seeing a whole cloth um, exit by any stretch of the imagination. What do you what do you think when you hear decoupling? Are you a decoupling uh, skeptic like Temur, um, or do you see evidence of real decoupling um, happening on the ground? For me. I don't see it very much. I mean, I see what, you know, it's, it's interesting because the data may show this in areas. I'd be interested to hear what others have to say on this, especially Tamar. But, you know, when we, we have a very big presence in China, we have a huge business where we're advising Western multinationals in China. And we have a huge business here in Southeast Asia advising Western multinationals with regional headquarters here who are also looking at China, right? And we just don't see... Um, you know, from a from a business to business perspective, we don't see a big exit out. We don't see a big um, decoupling per se. I mean, certainly, I think there are. You know, there's if you take a step back at a more macro level and you say, are there value differences there? Yes. Are there differences in how business is done and what to expect and how you know maybe a growing cleavage and things like IP, which you know the U.S. you know U.S. multinationals no longer want to accept some of the rules of the road that were there a few years back, you know, that's definitely an issue. I think what'll be interesting with the Biden presidency if he wins is he has said, um, and his potential team has said, they're gonna put values front and center in foreign policy. And that includes the things like, you know, labor rights and supply chains and things that are gonna impact businesses, you know, in China. And so what'll be interesting to see is does a Biden presidency um, turn up the dial as it relates to, um, business in China and kind of compliance issues, ESG, you know, environmental social governance issues that then US companies have to ensure that they're compliant with. Does that, you know, impact um, how China relates to that, to US from an economic perspective? And then if so, what does China do, right? So one thing that we at Control Risk are watching closely is we think that China's response, especially in the last, you know, six to 12 months, to what the Trump administration has um, done and said, and you can talk about the students in the states that have been you know, detained and diplomats and whatnot um, being asked to leave. But if, if you look at what the Trump administration has done, the, the China's, um, Chinese government has not uh, met and exceeded that in terms of a response, right? They've been measured in their approach compared to what they potentially could have done, right? And so I think what a lot of people are watching is how does that then change? So if Biden becomes president, you know, of course he's going to try to reset the relationship in some way. There's some areas he can do that, some areas that he can't because you know this tension is now a structural feature as we've discussed of the of the relationship. But at any rate, um, what he does, you know, the question is what is the Chinese response to that, and does it start to become less measured and a little bit more punchy, and then and then what happens from there? Uh, thanks, Angela. Um, I have another kind of set of questions about uh, a Biden presidency that I'm going to throw to you, Zemur, and then we'll go to sort of a second uh, Trump term and what that would mean. Um, uh, Zemur, to you, uh, three words popping up a lot in the Q&A box, and, and, um, and those are trade war, globalization, multilateralism. Um, so what, what becomes of the Trump trade war? Uh, under a Biden presidency, um, do we return to a pre-Trump era of globalization? Um, should Biden come to office? And should we expect a more kind of multilateral approach uh, rather than an America first approach? I think the last part of the question is easiest to answer. Yes, of course, you know, there will be perhaps some degree of re-energization of the WTO. Uh, at some point, there would be revisitation of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but these are not, again, near-term priorities. This is down the road, not the first 90 days of Biden presidency, in my view, but overall cooling of tensions one can expect. But on the issue of US-China rivalry around trade, we need to consider two distinct issues. One is the demand for level playing field, and that's a reasonable demand that can be reinforced through multilateralism. You bring in other countries who also demand greater market access and uh, no expropriation of technology, 
better data security, all that kind of stuff. That's fine. And I think to a very large extent, given for China, trade matters so much with the rest of the world, I think they would be amenable to raising their standards to that demand for a level playing field. But it seems to me the feeling in China, especially with these three and a half years of Trump presidency behind us, is that it is really not about a level playing field. It is about tech supremacy. So you see, when you talk about level playing field, it's not a zero sum game. It's a win-win for everybody. Uh, you get greater market access, I get greater market access, and we all become part of a bigger playing field and it's good for everybody. The need for tech dominance is a zero sum game. There, in order for the US to maintain its supremacy, it has to deprive China of technology, of markets, of revenues, and so on. So the feeling in Beijing is the latter is the more real underlying reason behind all this skirmish. It's not the demand for level playing field because that was the demand of the Obama administration and the Trans-Pacific Partnership was in some ways supposed to address that. But the moment it becomes very bilateral, it becomes very zero sum. And therefore going into 2021 and 2022, the big question, even for the Biden administration, if they're the ones who are gonna take over is that you know what is the real story here? Is it about level playing field or is it about maintenance of hegemony on the power side, but Drew will address that, but maintenance of tech supremacy on the sphere of economics, but also it has major national security implications as well. So when we talk about decoupling, we need to consider that, that in the areas where questions about data privacy, security come in, I think there the likelihood of the supply chain fragmenting and moving out of China is almost inevitable that there are certain things Americans simply will not purchase if it is made in China. But if you think about a very wide range of other products, you know, TV sets uh, or furniture or Christmas ornaments or even PPEs for that matter, most of the world, including the US will be okay purchasing those things. Uh, whether it's Trump or Biden running the show. So, so to me, that really is the issue. I mean, the, to me, you know, bringing back manufacturing jobs and protecting farmers or steel workers is a sideshow. In my view, there's not a whole lot of substance behind it. Those dynamics are driven by much longer term structural factors like automation, use of technology. Uh, it's not about China. It's about the way world economics is evolving. True. Let's uh, let's talk about the possibility of a second Trump term. If President Trump prevails, um, would that embolden the China hawks, the China hardliners in his administration, or would that cool things off a bit with the pressure uh, pressure of the election uh, being off? So, I mean, one thing that Trump has proven is his unpredictability. Um, so, I think uh, I'd be a fool to predict what the next administration would hold if it were Trump or actually Biden, for that matter. I, I think I think the administration gives the, the the campaign, for example, for Biden gives us some clues. But until you're actually in office, until that interagency decision making process uh, kicks in, uh, it's very difficult to really predict what's going to come out. Um, but yes, we can certainly presume, and, and, and as, as Timur said, you know, at the beginning, you know, that, that you know, both of these gentlemen have a worldview, and they're very much set in their ways. And Trump has that isolationist perspective, so it's not surprising that, for instance, he didn't join uh, the the Covax uh, multinational vaccine regime, whereas I think Biden would would instinctively seek to join it. So from that perspective, um, I think you'll see continuity to be sure. But again, part of the issue, of course, is you know, reaction and response to, to China. Um, I mean, if you think about kind of what China is going through, that's gonna drive a certain amount of what Biden has to, what either president has to deal with going forward. I mean, uh, right now, China is actually at one of these really important political turning points. The, the 13th five-year plan has ended. Uh, the 14th five-year plan is going to start next year, and that's going to seriously drive uh, a lot of the economic planning and policy process, including in the high-tech sector. Um, the, the, and that's taking place now. The fifth plenum is actually going on this week, um, and that will be blessed in March of next year at the National uh, Party, at the National People's Congress. But what gets interesting there is sort of the big transition that's happened in the last, uh, you know, the last five, really 10 years. Um, as we've seen China sort of move up a value chain. I, I think uh, you, you've seen China go from, um, I think firstly, what you've seen is really an exacerbation of China's 
perception of threat and risk from the rest of the world. China sees the rest of the world as increasingly working against it as, as a threat, uh, whether that's Europe, the United States, um, Japan, you know, uh, I, I think Russia maybe is the only exception where they see some, some potential safety in a partner. So, so China is increasingly, in Xi Jinping's view, is very much that, that the rest of the world is not there to benefit China. Um, and that they pose potential threats to the Communist Party, whether that's an ideological threat internally or whether that's a, a, a broader security threat to the population through economic disruption, for example. But I think the issue is in that context, they've gone from this sort of mentality of seeing threats to their access to, to raw materials. And you'll remember, you know, 10 years ago, we were watching China invest heavily in access to mines throughout you know, Africa and in Southeast Asia. So you went from a mentality where China was, was hoarding natural resources to supply its manufacturing base to now where it's increasingly focused on hoarding technology, right? Integrated circuits. So, so I think th the issue here, and this is gonna be the challenge for either administration, for either president, is that China is inherently distrustful of the world right now. And that's part of Xi Jinping's mindset. So how do you reassure a country that is, is distrustful and is hard and is, is, is almost impossible to reassure? Um, and we're seeing that in terms of you know, a challenge that Europe faces, that Japan faces, and that the US faces. So, so I think the next administration can come in with different strategies, but it's gonna have to in, take into account essentially the, the entrenchment that, that China currently feels uh, that it's in. So, so Either president that comes in is gonna essentially have, have two choices to make. They can be more like China, which I think is partly what this administration is doing uh, with its kind of America first policy. So, I mean, the decoupling is now taking place on two sides. Um, or you can, um, and you might call that the sort of, you know, put cones around it strategy, um, where you let China sort of continue to prosper, but you cut yourself off from it and then you manage your allies around it. I mean, the alternative is, is to, to, to sort of manage those alliances and partners and, and, and continue to try to shape China. But I think, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, hawks, um, you know, it's hard to find people who identify as doves, right? I mean, most people, you know, aren't accommodationist by nature at this point towards China. So the question really comes down to, do you engage them to effect or do you isolate the, the threats and the risk and work with others uh, to, 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 to mitigate that threat, and then basically hold out until China itself politically is in a more comfortable place where it doesn't see the world as a threat, where it has more faith in international markets to provide it with uh, the resources, whether they're technology or raw materials, that it needs to survive and prosper. There's a question for you, Drew, from one of our viewers. Um, who is more likely to defend Taiwan, Trump or Biden? <laughs> uh, that, I mean, that's a difficult question for anyone to ask, um, and it's obviously one that that Taiwan asks. I think I think the 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 people of Taiwan, the government of Taiwan, is greatly appreciative of what the Trump administration has done for it. I mean, we just had an arms sale announcement uh, overnight. I think that's like the fourth or fifth one this week. Um, the Trump ad administration has really invested heavily in strengthening. The, the U.S. Taiwan relationship, and, and again, you know, that's not necessarily a China play. Um, that's really a reflection of the U.S. pursuing its own interests. I mean, Taiwan is the U.S. tenth or eleventh largest trading partner. I mean, that's larger than Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, larger than any Southeast Asian country. So, I mean, Taiwan is a major interest for the United States uh, from just a pure economic perspective. It's you know, it's a major source of technology. There's a very large overseas uh, Taiwan population in the United States, which makes them a domestic voice as well. So, so I think from that perspective, um, you know, the U.S.-Taiwan relationship has never been stronger in this administration. And the Trump administration has really looked at it in its own right and not made it a subset of, of its China policy. And as a result, it also hasn't deterred itself from making choices that would make China unhappy uh, because it's, it's really not, not a concern for this administration. So they've, they've accepted that friction, they've accepted that risk and, and pursued their interests pretty relentlessly. So, so I would think it's a pretty clear choice. 
But that said, you know, there's a certainly a great deal of concern about U.S. credibility. Trump is unpredictable. So um, there is concerns that, you know, he is Mr. Art of the Deal and he might um, you know, trade away Taiwan's interest for uh, a better deal with China, per se, perhaps. And I think that's, a, that's an ingrained sense within Taiwan amongst many of the elites and leaders is that, you know, the U.S. traded away Taiwan before. Um, in 1979, when it switched recognition, and and that great that was you know the great abandonment, and I think that that still still very much informs the way uh, Taiwan it feels its insecurities in terms of its security uh, situation. So part of all of those arms sales that have been going on the last couple of months in the Trump administration is Taiwan going through a real effort to secure its own uh, future through self deter through deterrence and self defense and relying less on the United States militarily. Uh, so much of its transformation in that respect is really about its own resilience. So, you know, the important thing to remember is, you know, foreign countries don't get a choice in the US election profit, uh, process. They, they may have preferences, um, but it's really up to the American people to make that decision. So we have five minutes left. I'm afraid we have to wind down. Uh, we're going to move to closing comments. Um, I'm going to ask very quick questions of each of the three speakers. And if you could respond to that question and then also make your closing comments at, uh, at the same time, that would be great. Um, Angela, starting with you on the question of CPTPP, um, is a Biden administration likely to revisit or reopen this question of whether uh, the US participates in some kind of trade pact to the exclusion of China in Asia, or is that more or less a closed chapter? Yeah, I think that is a potential option. Um, you know, Biden has said on the campaign trail that, uh, you know, that's something that basically the TPP wasn't perfect, but the concepts behind it were a good idea. Um, I think the, the people around him on the campaign see that as a great way to, you know, have more economic engagement in Asia as opposed to just the military engagement, uh, which we've seen more with the Trump administration, which has had criticism for, you know, less on the economic side. But the challenges, you know, we've uh, raised it already on this call. I mean, the, there's the, the, the left wing of the Democratic Party uh, is going to be pushing hard ag against that. You know, the Democratic Party platform has frankly come out straight out and said that there's, and Biden has said this himself directly, there's going to be no new trade deals made until there's been investment in the American worker and American manufacturing. So I think the inclination is there, We may, but it's gonna be very hard to do in practice. And of course, everyone knows time has moved on and they'd have to revisit it anyways. But look for a narrower deal perhaps with some of the CPTPP countries on things like medical equipment or things like climate, you know, that may be a, a, a step in. Great, um, Drew, to you a question on security and military ties. As you mentioned in your opening remarks, there was kind of the Obama era pivot to Asia that never quite uh, materialized. There was a Trump era Indo-Pacific framing and the, and the Quad. Um, particularly in the South China Sea where things have become a bit more heated, uh, what impact does this election, whether it's a Trump victory or a Biden victory, have um, on uh, events in the South China Sea? I don't think it's a significant factor. I mean, again, you have to remember that, you know, the US is not a claimant state. Um, so it doesn't have a direct competing claim with China. So the US really the interest, um, particularly um, uh, in, in any security sense is, is really focused on, on two things, being able to traverse uh, and cross through the South China Sea, right? I mean, the, the US Navy needs to get to the Indian Ocean and the Middle East and to get from the US West Coast to the Middle East, you have to pass through the South China Sea. So that freedom of freedom of navigation issue is really the critical interest. It's not about the, 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 the claim to the territory. The other issue, of course, would be um, the US alliances. So it really comes down to the Philippines and how hard is the Philippines going to uh, seek to protect its, its claim? How is it gonna hedge between the US and China? And, and the US will continue to adapt to that. But again, in terms of all the flashpoints in the region, the Philippines is really the only uh, uh, hook that would bring the, the American interest into direct conflict with China. Um, the, the, I think the much bigger flashpoints are in Northeast Asia, uh, in uh, the Cross Strait 
Taiwan scenario, uh, the East China Sea, if, if Japan-China relations deteriorate worse, or of course the, 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 you know, the, the forever risk of North Korea, uh, Korean Peninsula scenario. Uh, then with the final word to you, there is a good deal of anxiety in kind of the rest of Asia about the US and China not getting along. Uh, where we are here in Singapore, Prime Minister Lee has said on a number of occasions, uh, don't make us choose sides. Um, what matters particularly to Southeast Asia countries going into this US election, uh, bearing in mind what Drew said earlier, that actually foreign countries have no, no say, of course, in, in the outcome. But what matters to Southeast Asia countries um, uh, in, in this uh, US presidential election? And, and who wins tomorrow if countries in Southeast Asia uh, could, could cast a ballot? I think Southeast Asian nations, while they're keen not to want to pick a side, they crave for clarity and leadership from the US. Uh, this region has been a massive beneficiary of access to US markets, receiving security cooperation from the US over the last half a century or longer, actually ever since the end of the Second World War. So the notion that the nation is sort of going to become inward looking would move away from its uh, Pacific century uh, proclamations is uh, worrisome for Asian policymakers. No matter how much uh, tight their relationship with China is with respect to trade, with respect to commerce, movement of people and cultural affiliation and so on, I think just about every single country in Asia, uh, once checks and balances, uh, is not looking for a unipolar world, uh, would like to see the US play a leading role and remain engaged with the region. Um, to the extent that there is this gap between perception and reality, because the reality is, I think you've heard both Angela Drew and, and of course, you know, myself talk about the fact that when you look at actual security cooperation and military cooperation and economic cooperation, things haven't really changed that much, but the rhetoric has been disconcerting. Uh, it would help a lot for sentiments, for long-term business opportunity uh, implementation to change the rhetoric to one that is a little lower decibel, a little more engaging and uh, useful and more akin to the win-win narrative, because I think a zero-sum narrative makes everybody nervous because that would then require somebody to lose for somebody else to win. So I'm pretty sure Asia would not want to be in that camp. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. I want to thank the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy for putting this session together and to our panelists for this fantastic discussion and, for, and to everyone who tuned in, have, have a good rest of the week and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.